In the fast-paced, brand-loyal sport of NASCAR, few teams have won more races or worked with more marquee brands than Joe Gibbs Racing. Since its founding in 1992 by pro football and NASCAR Hall of Famer Joe Gibbs, team president Dave Alpern has worked alongside its famed owner, playing a key role in the organization's growth and success over its 30-plus year history. Starting as an unpaid intern, Alpern has held nearly every position in the front office, helping to lead a startup team from 15 employees to over 500 and into NASCAR's winningest organizations across the sport's top two national series. Alpern has worked with top executives from some of America's biggest and best brands and has helped guide elite race car drivers into polished corporate spokesmen. He's a frequent university guest lecturer and a highly sought after corporate keynote speaker. He's also appeared on countless podcasts and media outlets. Dave married his college sweetheart, Stacy, and they have three adult boys who were born and raised in their hometown of Charlotte. Dave considers it his greatest joy to be a dad. Alpern shares the stories and principles he's learned over his three decade career in his published book, Taking the Lead, winning principles that fuel Joe Gibbs Racing. The book has been endorsed by C-level executives, Hall of Fame drivers, and leaders in both ministry and entertainment. Please welcome Dave Alpern. Morning, fellas. Good morning, good morning. Thank you, uh, Pastor Gary, Austin. Uh, my first uh, steak and study, to be honest with you, you had me at steak. It was all, then there was the study, but the steak. So um, it's great to be, uh, to be up here. I, this is my hometown. This is a hometown crowd. Uh, did have some, some of my Oakton uh, brothers in the crowd. I have some, actually, some of my brother-in-laws here. Uh, my dear father-in-law is here. I've got a nephew uh, here. I've got a couple of my young life leaders here. So uh, it's great to be at a little bit of a home crowd. Honestly, so last weekend we were racing in Charlotte at the Coca-Cola 600, and one of the drivers came up to me, uh, Corey LaJoy, one of the NASCAR drivers, and goes, hey, I heard you're speaking at the steak and study at Cornerstone. <laughs> Goodness gracious. So he said, yeah, I, I watch online every week. Um, as Pastor uh, Gary mentioned, uh, Coach Gibbs, again, uh, and Pat consider this their home, uh, their home church. They listen every week. To be honest with you, I shared with them a couple days ago, hey, I'm, I'm not gonna be at the race this weekend. I'm speaking at Cornerstone. I think he was a little hacked that you asked me and not him. <laughs> Told him I'd put in a good word for him while I was up here. <laughs> I said, maybe some point you, you can get to the point where you can, where you can speak. But uh, it is, it is, uh, it's, it's great to be up here. Um, I'll get right off the, I'll start right off the beginning and say, uh, how many of you, by a show of hands, have ever been to a NASCAR race? All right, okay, I speak at colleges a lot. I don't get that many hands, that's pretty good. All right, how about this one? If you've seen either Days of Thunder or Talladega Nights, there we go, all right, okay. <laughs> it's nothing like that. I'm just, I'm, I hate to break it to you. But anytime Will Ferrell and Tom Cruise do a movie about your sport, that's actually pretty cool. Um, so it's a little bit different um, than a lot of people uh, might envision. Let, let, let me let you, in, uh, let you in a little bit on how it works. It's basically 40 guys go in circles for about four hours around a track, and at the end, one of them wins. That's pretty much, that's pretty much how it works. Um, we're a little different than most pro sports teams in that we actually have teams competing against each other. So of those 40 cars that go around in circle every week, four of them, belong to Joe Gibbs Racing. I have three boys. It, you could imagine, those of you who have kids, if your kids all competed in something together, it's pretty much chaos the whole time. You default to whoever does the worst. At least three of our guys are hacked off at the end of every race, and so it's pretty much generally chaos. But I have a, I have a, I have a little something, I have a little gift, I have a trivia question here, and anyone who I named at the beginning, friends, relatives, you are excluded from this. So I mentioned we have four cars, four teams that compete against each other. Is there anyone that can name the four drivers that drive for Joe Gibbs Racing? Quick hand, quick hand, okay, right here. Truex. Truex. Denny Hamlin. Christopher Bell. 
You're, you're, you're getting the prize for naming three, but give me the fourth one. Okay, let me let you off the hook. The, Ty Gibbs, all right, so here you go. So we just won our 400th win as a race team. The most, I mean, I don't mean to brag, but the, it's the most of all time. There's a 400 win hat. Oh, all right. All right, so these are our guys. So we got Denny Hamlin, uh, Martin Truex are our two veterans. We've got Christopher Bell and Ty Gibbs. And by the way, in NASCAR, a driver peaks in his late 30s, so a uh, li little bit older than uh, some pro sports. So these two on the left are our veterans. We've got young Christopher Bell and then Ty Gibbs. And if you recognize the name, yes, that is actually Joe Gibbs' grandson, who is by five years the youngest driver in our top series, the Cup Series. He's 20 years old, just moved up to the top series this week. The guy in the middle, that's my boss. That is the aforementioned Joe Gibbs. He is a kind of cool distinction, the only human being who is in both the NASCAR and Pro Football uh, Hall of Fame. Um, and the, the stories you heard about him sleeping in the office in football, they're all true. Um, he, he, people, people ask me all the time, well, he's not like really involved day to day. <laughs> oh, oh, yes, he is. Um, <laughs> He is nonstop, um, again, working for a NASCAR team. Uh, you, again, you, you, you may have seen movies, I know, in the Daytona 500, or in, the, uh, in Days of Thunder, they build a car in a barn and win the Daytona 500. It's a little different than that. Um, we have 350,000 square feet in Charlotte. To give you perspective, we have 50 engineers. Um, we have one guy with a... PhD in vehicle dynamics from Stanford. I mean, he's so smart. Literally, I feel stupid just when I walk by his office, not even talking to him. Um, we fly about 100, I appreciate the courtesy laugh. Um, we fly about 150 people every week to the racetrack. We have our own airplanes, our own flight attendants, mechanics, uh, pilots. Uh, the scale of what we do is a little, a li a little above what most people think. Um, 75% of our revenue comes from the sponsors whose names you see on these drivers' uniforms. So when people ask, what do you do as the president of a race team? 75% probably of my time is keeping them happy. So I'm dealing with C-level executives from Toyota, FedEx, Bass Pro Shops, DeWalt, all the time. And, and we also are dealing with you know, upwards of 600 employees, uh, race car drivers, which is a, basically a, a, a short way of saying, it's chaos all the time. And, and to be honest with you, um, it never turns off. And many of you probably know what that's like um, in the job that you do, um, where it, you just feel like it never stops. Um, it wasn't always this way. Uh, when I went to Joe Gibbs Racing, we had 15 people. So again, I went to George Mason University up here. Um, when I graduated, I got a chance to be an unpaid intern with a startup NASCAR team. So I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina on a hunch. And the hunch was, everything that guy touches turns to gold. I, turned my, I told my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, um, my father-in-law's in the room, I was trying to uh, work my way up to be able to get married, and my father-in-law and I kind of had a deal. <laughs> it was kind of his deal. <laughs> Let's just be clear. Um, you kind of need to have a job before I'm gonna give you my blessing. So I went down with the hopes that one day they would actually start paying me, um, but I just had a hunch. So I moved to Charlotte, literally slept on the floor for two months of an apartment with uh, uh, coach's oldest son, J.D. Gibbs, and another guy, because there wasn't an extra room. And they didn't have anywhere to put me at our first race shop, so they actually emptied out a broom closet, which I'm not exaggerating, it was a, it was a converted broom closet. And I, I had, the only thing I had room for was one of those little elementary school desks, you know, with the top attached to the bottom. And I had an elementary school desk. And so this is early 90s, so no internet. I had no screen. I literally had a spiral notebook on the top of my desk, and there's no electrical outlets in a broom closet. So I had an orange extension cord that went all the way out into the hallway that was plugged into a floor lamp that sat next to said desk. I, I did have a phone, and that actually had to go all the way to the receptionist's desk. And I mean, full disclosure, I don't think it rang for like six months. I mean, who's calling me? <laughs> that guy putting stickers on the car? And I started booking hotel rooms or doing whatever I could do to earn my keep. Because I, I kind of discovered something early on in, in my career, and that was the who was more important than the what. So in other words, I was hitching my wagon to the guy, one of my peer, the, the peer who I'm, I probably respected most in my, I was a young believer at the time, J.D. Gibbs. 
and Coach was one of my spiritual heroes. And I wanted to be around him. We, we could have been selling coat hangers and it wouldn't have mattered. And so the fact that I was in a broom closet putting stickers on a car and booking hotel rooms didn't matter. I was working for Joe Gibbs and I, I really wanted to stick around. So again, my career has been a journey of working my way from that broom closet and then through an unbelievable set of circumstances becoming the president of a professional sports organization, which is what I kind of outline, um, which is one of the things that I outline in my books. Anyone who works at Joe Gibbs Racing will tell you that uh, when you start working there, you get a speech from coach. It's a pretty simple one. Pretty intimidating, but pretty simple. It goes something like this. Welcome to Joe Gibbs Racing. There's a name on your shirt, and it isn't yours. Don't embarrass me. That's it. Okay, good talk. <laughs> he spent decades, he's in two sports hall of fames, and when I go anywhere wearing Joe Gibbs Racing, I'm representing the name on the shirt. When I go into a restaurant, the way that I treat the server reflects on the name on the shirt. When I return my rental car, the condition that I leave it in reflects on the name on the shirt. Quick story, uh, many years ago, we had a couple of uh, engineers who, who, let's just say, uh, okay, they cheated. They, they, they created a device that was illegal. And look, there's a saying in NASCAR, if you're not cheating, you're not trying. The executives kind of go, okay, please don't tell us that. Just, just build the cars legally. Everyone's trying to find out ways to get an advantage. And two guys came up with a device that was illegal. So Coach and I are out <clears throat> uh, dialing for dollars as we do when we're trying to keep sponsors and we were out somewhere meeting with a corporate partner and we got the call, hey, um, we just got a really big penalty for something illegal and we're like, good gosh. And we're, so we're at dinner and this is true. There's TVs at the restaurant we're at. An hour after this, literally on the, on the ticker of Sports Center, it says Joe Gibbs Racing busted for cheating. And I'm sitting with Joe Gibbs going, okay, this is, this is a lot of fun. The next day, this is a true story, my dear wife is at the grocery store and a lady who goes to our church comes up and taps her on her shoulder. Stacy's like, oh hi, how does it feel to know your husband works for a cheater? Okay, l let's set aside that that is way inappropriate, but the point being, the actions of two guys reflected on me, my wife, and Joe Gibbs because everything we do represents the name on the shirt. So these guys, those sponsors, these guys are brand ambassadors for those sponsors. Denny Hamlin is basically an extension of FedEx. He has to go to FedEx and learn all about FedEx. He knows as much as a FedEx full-time salesperson because everything he says, says reflects FedEx. When he tweets something, which <laughs> let me just say, drivers with a lot of free time, they'll tweet something controversial every now and then, like days ending and why. Um, FedEx doesn't like it when Denny does something stupid. We had a driver for 15 years. Anybody ever heard of Kyle Busch? One, <laughs> I hear some chuckles. Once in a generation talent, won us two championships. He, he moved on um, to another team this year. Kyle Busch for 15 years was sponsored by M&Ms. Do you know who M&Ms is? Audiences, middle-aged moms. That's who, they're, that's who they're trying to sell to. They don't like controversy. There was one race in particular where Kyle, with an in-car camera on his face, was really upset with something NASCAR had, had uh, a ruling they'd made in the race, so he proceeded to tell the camera it was number one for an entire lap around the racetrack with his live mic keyed up, using every word you could imagine, telling NASCAR up in the tower what they could do with the ruling that they just made. It was aired on television, and M&M's switchboard lit up. I'm never buying M&M's again. That, you got Kyle Busch speaking for you. That guy, I had to fly to Phoenix the next week and we had to sit down with Kyle and they wanted to suspend him and we had to pull his sponsorship. It was a nightmare. Why? Because everything he does reflected the name on his shirt. As believers, the moment we come to Christ, there's a name on our shirt and it isn't ours. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ, the name above all names. We're not talking about FedEx. We're not talking about Joe Gibbs. We're talking about the name above all names, Jesus Christ. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was making his appeal through us. Again, our drivers, they're making an appeal, the, the sponsor's appeal through them, through the, through the platform of NASCAR. 
Men, we're, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ as though God was making appeal through us, through each of you. Thank the Lord I had ambassadors in my life. Many of them are here. My two young life leaders, John and Rick, had the guts to come in my high school. God used them to be ambassadors to my band of brothers. I have a text chain 35 years later with 11 guys who were all transformed by those ambassadors that came in our lives. God used my wife in high school, a godly woman, to give me a picture of what that would look like 29 years later, actually 35 years later, but 29 of marriage, we're still married. God's used different men, my father-in-law, Joe Gibbs, to be ambassadors in my life. How are we doing? How are we representing Christ? I want to talk about a couple illustrations, just a couple tangible things. What does it look like to be an ambassador, an ambassador for Christ? Be a fountain, not a drain. What, is, what does that look like? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna lie, there's two type of people when they walk in my office. There's one where I see them walk in the door, I kind of go, Ugh, this is gonna hurt. Because I know, complain, gossip, identify some problem with no thought of what the solution is, they're just gonna drop the bomb and leave. They're basically going to suck the life out of the interaction. And then, there's the other type of person, the fountains. They come in, I'm out of my desk before they come in because I know they're about to breathe life into the interaction. Fountains and drains. Guys, it's a choice we make every morning. And as ambassadors for Christ, shame on us if we're a drain. Now if you go out in the, in the lobby and get a drink from the water fountain, you will notice something. The water fountain is plugged into what? A water source. If you unplug it, it is no longer capable of being a fountain. As believers, to be a fountain, we have to be connected to the source. That source is God. It's Jesus Christ, the name above all names, and our relationship with him, and spending time in the word, and having fellowship, and, and, and worship. Um, going to church on Sunday is awesome, but if that's all it is, you ain't gonna be a fountain. You have gotta be connected to the source 24-7, being in a spirit of prayer, spending time in the word, prioritizing it. Be a fountain, not a drain, as an ambassador for Christ. Treat people like a soul and not a transaction. I, I learned this uh, firsthand. Uh, my brothers will tell you, J.D. Gibbs was probably the best example of this in my life as a peer. You, you all know what it's like to be treated like a transaction when somebody meets you. I, I can tell you working for Joe Gibbs my whole career, I experienced it almost every day. I would see someone and they would start talking to me like they were actually interested and I'd get my hopes up and we'd get near the end and they'd go, so, so, so could you introduce me to Joe? I really have something to ask him and I'd kind of, my shoulders would slump and I'd go, that's what I thought. They wanted me to get to something else. Or they're looking over your shoulder when they talk to you. Guys, everyone you interact with, I don't care if it's at Starbucks or the grocery store, if it's a subordinate or a coworker or a superior, everyone, fearfully and wonderfully made, a soul, they're dealing with stuff. If you're an ambassador for Christ, treat them like a soul, not a transaction. How about our job? So people ask me, hey, what's the number one thing as a Christian business that, that we should know that you, that you guys do? And I think my answer surprises them. Number one, be really good at what you do. Number one. If we were the 15th best race team and had never won a race, I can assure you I would not be speaking here right now. Who's that guy? This guy stink. If you're showing up at work late, leaving early, talking about people, dogging on things, take, not take, I got news for you. Nobody cares what you think. I got a saying, nobody cares what you think if you stink. <laughs> Be really good at what you do if you, wanna, if you wanna have a platform. Whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. I don't care where, what your stage is in life, if you're a student, if you're an intern in a broom closet, or if you're the president of your company, it doesn't matter. Be all that God made you to be. Be great at what you do. You are representing the God of the universe, the name above all the names, and the way that you go about your work every day. So you better do that well first before you worry about evangelizing to your coworkers, because you're evangelizing to them by the way that you live your life, I can assure you that. How about your priorities? If we put everybody's Google Calendar up here on the, on the screen, what would it say about the name on your shirt? And let me say, from somebody who struggles with margin, the, the, I, I wanna tell you, you brothers, um, be fiercely intentional with your schedule. 
But if I looked at your calendar, what would it say? Who, who do you serve? If you're a dad, are you prioritizing time with your kids? If you're married, are you prioritizing your wife? Are you taking care of yourself? Are you spending time in the word? Are you serving? Are you using the gifts that God, that God gave you? So I would just encourage you, and I know this one is really, really hard because, I mean, look, my wife has a saying, even when it's easy, life's hard. Life is hard. There is a lot going on, and, and, and it may look different for you. If you're, if you're in medical school right now, the amount of margin that you have is gonna be different than maybe somebody else in another stage. That's okay, but take an inventory of your priorities and, and, what is it, and, and, let's, and ask yourself, hey, what does this say about the God that I serve? And remember, we're all just stewards of our position. Like, I am only a steward of my job. God did not allow me to be the president of Joe Gibbs Racing to serve myself. I am a steward until the next person does it. You are a steward. It's the same way we are with our money. It is not ours. It is a great privilege to be entrusted with whatever your position is. Do it unto the Lord. How about your social media, by the way? If somebody who didn't know you just looked at your social media feed, what would it say about the name on your shirt? I'm just curious. And I'm asking this to myself. Man, when I, when I post something for work, I am so paranoid that I hashtagged everything right and I didn't do anything to offend one of my sponsors or Joe Gibbs. How, how much more when I post should I worry about how I'm representing my relationship with Jesus Christ and the name on my shirt? What, what, what does what I'm posting say about the God I serve? Does it say that he's red or blue? Does it say that he's complaining all the time? Just think about that next time you push send, that you are representing <laughs> the name above all names in everything that you do. Um, I wanna read a scripture that was actually, Rick, Rick and John may not remember this, but this was the first scripture they had me memorize as a young believer. Many of you know this. Um, it's Hebrews 12, one and two. Who knew I would end up in racing? I don't think they were talking about auto racing, but it's close enough, and I love this passage, so we're gonna walk through this a little bit. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We're surrounded by a great crowd of witnesses, heroes of the faith in this room. Many of my heroes, many of the ambassadors, thankfully, that came into my life are, are right here. My band of brothers, JD, my father-in-law, we can't do this by ourselves, guys. We were not meant to do this in isolation. There's a reason in the Bible they were not sent out one by one. <laughs> We've gotta have accountability. We've gotta have brothers doing with this. This should be a huge encouragement to everybody in here. Throw off everything that hinders. What's hindering us? So at the end of every race season, we have an exercise that we do. We take every nut and bolt and part and piece off the car. I say we. I'm nowhere near this. These are the actual technical people who make the car go fast, not the expendable carpet walkers. Let's just be clear about that. We lay every part and piece out from the car. The car has to weigh a certain amount, but you want to put the weight where you want it. So the lighter you can make every part means you can put the weight in places that make the car faster. So we lay every nut and bolt out and we look at Six ounces here, eight ounces here. How can, we, how can we take an inventory of everything that makes that car go fast and how can we make it better? When's the last time you did that with your life? Take an inventory of it all. My priorities, how's my marriage? Do I have guys that I'm investing in? Am I using my gifts? Am I, am I, am I being mentored and am I mentoring someone? How, how, how's my health? Am I taking care of myself? I hope you have brothers in your life or one brother or somebody that can, that, can, that can hold you accountable to that to say, hey, here's an area I'm struggling. I need you to pray for me. I need you to hold me accountable. If we're not throwing off, if we're not connected to the source and, and taking an inventory of what's hindering us, it is hard to run this race. The sin that so easily entangles, there's a gajillion things that can entangle us in a NASCAR race, a penalty, speeding on pit road, too many men over the wall on a pit stop, crashes, um, cheating, doing stupid things that get us penalized. It's hard, again, 
have accountability, be connected to the source uh, to hold you accountable for the things that might be entangling uh, in your life. Let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. A NASCAR season is grueling. It starts in February at the Daytona 500, goes all the way to November, 38 weeks we race. It is a range of emotions and you are not awarded the trophy at the end because you led every lap and won every race. It's never happened, it's not possible. Some weeks stink. Some weeks we finish, we wreck all four cars. Some weeks we actually have finished first, second, third, fourth. And those are less happy than they should be, by the way, because again, somebody's always hacked off. We fly home from the races. I sit for 30 years, I sit in the seat right next to coach. It is a range of emotions after the race. I can just tell you that. Ranging from, hey, let's eat pizza, let's call the sponsors, it was a great day, to the more often response, which is, this is the most important week of our lives, guys. This was a horrible race, we gotta get better next week. But I say that to say, it takes perseverance. It is a marathon. Our, our walk with Christ is a marathon. It is not a sprint. We have our eyes, um, we, we have our eyes on the prize. Um, we don't get caught up. You are gonna have bad weeks. You're gonna have bad seasons of your life. What's the key? The last part, fix our eyes on Jesus. So in racing, we have, a, we have what we call a North Star, and it, Joe Gibbs Racing, and I think it's, it's one of the secrets when, when businesses ask what's your, what's your secret sauce in your business. We have been singularly focused 30 years on our North Star, and that is this, it's our one question. It's the question we ask before every hire, every capital purchase, anything we do, we ask one simple question, does this make us go fast? Sounds really simple. But as a race team, we figured we're competing with billionaires and icons in the sport. If we lead the most laps and win the most races, everything else will take care of itself. And it has. Does this make us go fast? What's your North Star as a believer? You are fixing your eyes on Jesus. I get seasick. Anyone who gets seasick knows you gotta fix your eyes on something in the distance or you will be a train wreck. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Stay connected to the source. Every morning, are you spending time in the word? Are you praying? Do you have brothers in your life doing things that say, hey, your job's hard, marriage is hard, parenting is hard. I am not going to be able to do this unless my eyes are fixed on Jesus and that I'm not wavering. Because by the way, as you're seeing, you know, God is not moving. Culture is doing this and getting further and further away. Fix your eyes on the one thing that ain't moving. Jesus, the name above all names. I think God is preparing each of you for something, just like he's been preparing me my whole career. I, I, Pastor Gary mentioned I wrote a book. I, I actually think our lives are very much like a book. If I'm honest with you, there's been a lot of pages, even entire chapters, that kind of sucked for me. Many times, a chapter of my life is happening and I'm questioning the one who wrote it saying, really God, this is, how, th this is not how I would have written this chapter. In fact, if I go through my entire life, start with high school, <laughs> these guys will tell you, my high school career didn't start off the way I would have wrote it, written it. I was 85 pounds, five feet tall, the smallest kid in a high school of over 3,000 people. Got stuffed in a trash can my first week of high school. That is a true story. You see movies and you're like, that stuff doesn't happen. Oh, oh it happens. I'm just telling you, it happens. Now, none of these guys were responsible, but I didn't see them there pulling me out of the trash can. I'm just gonna say that. Um, I, also, uh, I also have a, a neurological uh, disorder called Tourette syndrome, uh, which the symptoms were worse in high school. So being five feet tall, having twitches and making grunting sounds is a great recipe for making friends. Let me just, I'm kidding. Um, so that was how my high school started. It was miserable. And it was like a cruel joke. And I always knew God was there, but I didn't have a relationship with him. But I questioned, is this, is this really my lot in life? God knew what he was doing. God was preparing me. I did not grow up in the church. My father was actually Jewish. I actually had a, a father who I didn't know where he worked until I was 16. He told me he worked at the Pentagon. It turns out my dad worked for the CIA. My dad spoke multiple languages uh, 
briefed at least one president. My, me and my sisters were all born in foreign countries, and I was his only son. So in our home, the God was achievement. Hey, Northern Virginia, I get it. I grew up here. You're going to go to a great college. You're going to get a great job, and you're going to be just like me. I wanted to be. I did not have a church background. Little did I know my junior year, Rick Beckwith and John Colson would walk into my high school as ambassadors, and I would be exposed through the ministry of Young Life uh, to Jesus Christ. And by the way, I was one of those kids that kind of stiff-armed them for about a year and a half. I was like, this is nuts. I cannot go back to my dad and tell my dad that I've fallen for this. My dad was an electrical engineer, and everything had to be uh, scientific, and so I resisted for many years until my senior year when I gave all I knew of myself to all I knew of Jesus, which wasn't very much at the time. To this day, I mentioned 35 years later, my greatest, my, God didn't give me biological brothers, but he gave me spiritual brothers. My band of brothers are my dearest friends in the world. High school was the, literally the greatest experience of my life, but when the chapter started, I had no idea. Fast forward to college. I, got in, I did not get into my first two choice of colleges. I wanted to go away with all my buddies, and I didn't go in. I did not want to stay close to home. I ended up living in an apartment with guys that I didn't know, that I answered in a newspaper ad. I was an electrical engineering major, right, because I was trying to please my dad, which in one week I knew, okay, this was a big mistake. <laughs> my first year of college was, to that point, the worst year of my life. And I question, I'm a new believer. I'm like, God, you didn't hook me up. What, what? All my Christian friends went away. What's the deal? Again, God was writing each page, writing my chapter, preparing me. Little did I know, the next year, I would meet my soulmate, my wife. God would bring her into my life because I was at George Mason. By staying in Virginia, it allowed me to be mentored by Rick and John, my young life leaders in my young faith, which I desperately needed. Two best buddies, Gumby and Moose, would end up transferring to George Mason and we would all live together, become young life leaders together. College, one of the all-time greatest experiences of my life. But in the time, in the moment, it didn't make sense. Maybe you're in a chapter that doesn't make sense right now. God was preparing me at each stage. And then as I mentioned my career, I'm gonna guess you didn't think that I thought I would start my career in a broom closet in a garage. You can imagine the days I sat at that desk thinking what a disappointment I was to my dad. Working for nothing in a garage in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I can tell you, I keep a prayer journal and for 20 years of my prayer journal, it's mostly, I, I think you're allowed to be a drain to God because I, I must have been a drain to God because I was venting going, okay, I'm tired of not being appreciated around here. I'm tired of, you know, not getting any credit for anything. I'd come up with an idea in a meeting and then, and then I wouldn't get credit for it and it really bothered me. And at each stage of my career, I thought, I could do that, I could do more. God, I'm made for more. What's the deal? And then in 2014, our dear brother JD uh, got sick. And about a year into his illness, it was clear he, he wasn't getting better as much as we hoped and prayed that he would. And the family came to me and they said, Dave, we want you to be the president. And on the day we announced me being the president of Joe Gibbs Racing, I was getting hundreds of texts, and I know everyone was well-wishing, but it was one of the worst days of my life because it was the day I really realized JD is not getting better. This is real, and I'm about to be the president of a family business that I am not in the family. But it was also a light bulb moment where I went, God, as always, you knew what you were doing. He had been preparing me for 20 years for a job that... I could have had a hundred scenarios, and I'm a planner. I'm three years out, none of them contemplated this. And they said, you're the only one that could do this because you've faithfully done each of the other things that have taught you how this business works so that now you can do this. So guys, I just want to share with you, if you are in a chapter, again, it may be a page, it may be a bad chapter, God's preparing you. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, run the race, I know that it's hard. Moose and I had the privilege of speaking at JD's funeral. JD went to be with the Lord in 2019. And in the hour and a half service, there was one thing that was never mentioned. Not one single thing that JD did at work was mentioned. Nothing. It was an hour and a half about the impact that he had on other people as, the great work, as a result of the great work he did, great at what he did. But he understood that 
That was just a platform to influence people, to treat people like a soul. I've got a great title. I'm the president of Joe Gibbs Racing. You know where it ain't going? On my tombstone. There are no titles on tombstones. It's gonna be about the impact that we had and how did we represent the name on the shirt. <clears throat> I wanna close us with um, maybe an encouragement as I, I talked a lot about my dad. My dad got cancer in 2009. He passed away in 2010. Uh, but the year before he died, um, my dad came to know the name above all names. My dad met the Lord through my dear father-in-law <laughs> in a full circle moment. Um, my dad came to Christ and was baptized with all three of his grandsons together. And I, thank you. I share that um, because it's an example. Three generations of my family, my sons, myself, my dad, transformed because of a couple of ambassadors who had the guts to walk into our life and God made his appeal to us through them. Men, you're ambassadors. You're gonna go out from this place and you're gonna all go to your different places. And I, I wanna, I just wanna encourage you. Um, there's a reason that narrow is the path and few follow it. It is hard. It's really hard. But I hope that, I, I know it's an encouragement for me. I hope looking around this room is an encouragement to each one of you that you are not doing this alone. You're not meant to do it alone. And so I, I would say go out, and like we do in NASCAR, run your race and represent the name on the shirt well. Thanks for, thanks for letting me have some time to share with you guys today. Um, And, and I, I was supposed to mention, there are a few books out there and I wanted to, I wanted to be clear on something. When I, so when I wrote the book, um, I wanted to be sure, I really wanted to tell the story. I re, actually, interesting background. My father was going to write a book which would have been far more interesting than mine about his career with the CIA and he started writing it when he got sick and I begged my dad to let me record his story so I could finish it for him and my dad, ever the optimist, said, I'm good and he wasn't and my family and future generations were sort of deprived of my dad's story so I decided 10 years ago my story may not be as exciting, but I want to tell of God's faithfulness in my life, which is why I wrote a book. I didn't want to make any money from it. Um, so all of my proceeds have been donated to J.D. Gibbs Legacy Fund, which funds urban ministry in Charlotte, North Carolina. And the books that are out back, Joe Gibbs Racing has purchased. So the $10 you pay, 100% is going to go to send urban kids to Young Life Camp this summer if you want to grab one. I just wanted to make sure everyone knew that. So, so with that, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks.